Jeff. Thanks for talking to us today. Before we get into the main questions about authentication issues, can you give us a brief introduction to yourself and your role at IBM? Hi, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a distinguished engineer with IBM, now in my 29th year with the company, and based in Raleigh, North Carolina in the U.S. Over the years, I've worked with customers on six continents and 40 countries, uh, working to define secure architectures for their most critical systems. I wrote a book some time ago entitled Inside Internet Security, What Hackers Don't Want You to Know, and I currently serve on the Computer Science Department's Strategic Advisory Board for my alma mater, North Carolina State University. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, I've got a few issues I'd like to explore with you, and to get us started, I'd like to ask whether you feel user authentication has kept pace with other advancements in security and with IT in general. I would have to say no. For instance, passwords are still the primary means of authentication and have been for as long as we've been using computers, uh, despite their many weaknesses. And unfortunately, alternative approaches, while they are improving, are still far from achieving the state of being obvious practical replacements. Now, you mentioned their weaknesses, and password-based approaches have certainly received a great deal of criticism over the years. What do you see as the main problems, and what, to what extent are these fundamental faults with the approach compared to the way in which we tend to use them? The fundamental problem with passwords is that they are based upon the premise that there is some secret knowledge that only the authorized user retains. Knowledge, unlike a physical token or a unique personal characteristic, is not intrinsically limited to residing in only one brain. It can, in fact, be shared willingly or unwillingly, and then it no longer authenticates just the authorized user. So one of the key areas in which we now find ourselves needing to authenticate ourselves is for online services. On average, do you feel the authentication methods employed on websites are commensurate with the data being protected on them? I think it varies. In some cases, the user is required to have a password when there really is nothing that needs to be protected. This is just a way for the company uh, providing the website to maintain information about the user, such as their browsing behaviors and things of that sort, in order to do more targeted marketing, marketing to them. In other cases, a relatively simple password is all that stands in the way of an attacker and a user's bank account or email account, which, by the way, can be used to recover passwords through a request for a password reset or a reminder at the bank's website, for instance. What you said about being required to have a password when there's nothing that really needs to be protected is a very fair point. I'd imagine many listeners will have found themselves having to create accounts and passwords seemingly for the sake of it, which seem to be more about enabling the site to track its users and actually being able to protect their information. Do you think this risks undermining the user's appreciation of passwords as a genuine security measure? Absolutely. The more times you do something, the more desensitized uh, you come to be toward that thing. Uh, therefore, the more times you have to create new user IDs and passwords, the less likely I think you will be to take the whole exercise seriously. The result is that most people keep reusing the same user ID and password over and over and over again for all their systems they log into, which means that if a poorly secured website becomes compromised, an attacker might have all the information they need to get into more important sites like your bank or your credit card company. In fact, an attacker could set up a scam website promising to offer some free service to those who register when, in fact, all they are really doing is harvesting email addresses and passwords, um, then, which they will then use to take over your email account or your bank account or whatever. Uh, this is why I recommend either using a single sign-on tool or a, a secure password storage tool, which can maintain unique, non-trivial passwords for all your accounts without your having to keep track of them yourself. This way, if an attacker gets the password to one account, it doesn't result in a cascading compromise of all of your accounts. What do you think about the level of support that sites typically give users in setting up and managing the authentication aspects of their accounts? For example, do they give enough guidance and do they help to enforce good practice? I think the guidance in this area varies greatly from site to site. Uh, many people still have no idea, for instance, why they need to enter a CAPTCHA, you know, that scrambled uh, bunch of letters that are supposed to authenticate that this is a, a human user as opposed to a machine or a script that is responding. Um, most people don't get what that's about, and they see it really as just a nuisance. Uh, 
more still see no problem with choosing trivial passwords or using the same password for all or most all of their online accounts. The problem is really larger than any single website and really cuts to the fundamental issue of security awareness training, which is sorely lacking for the vast majority of, you, of end users. I still feel that sites could have a useful part to play here. Having done some investigation, I found that even the leading sites are highly variable in terms of what they do. For example, some provide no good practice guidance and they enforce very few rules. I wonder if there's perhaps a case for having a standard baseline expectation, but that's probably a discussion for another day. Uh, for the moment, given that practices aren't exactly consistent, how should the appropriate level of authentication be determined? To what extent ought it to be dependent upon the data or the service that the user is accessing? And what about the types of access device, for example, the feasibility of doing the same things on mobile devices as on the desktop? All security decisions should be based upon a risk analysis. And that analysis should include not only the likely of compromise, the likelihood of compromise, but also the cost or consequence of compromise should it occur. Clearly, some websites contain little information of value, and therefore the use of a trivial password is of little consequence. However, other websites which contain highly valuable or personal information need to be protect protected with stronger forms of authentication in order to reduce risk to an acceptable level. It definitely is not a one-size-fits-all situation. In fact, risk uh, can be further reduced by considering to a greater degree the context or environment within which the authentication is occurring. For instance, a password entered on a shared kiosk in a public Internet cafe is not nearly as reliable as the same information uh, that might be entered from the actual user's own workstation. Now, that's assuming that proper security controls are in place for that user's workstation. Mobile devices pose additional risks uh, since the security controls available for them today are relatively immature. However, if a mobile device is used in conjunction with a password as part of a multi-factor authentication scheme, risk may be lowered further still. Another thing I've seen with mobiles is that although you can use traditional passwords to protect the devices, they tend to become far less convenient. For example, thanks to the size of the keyboard and the fact that the device is used for short bursts in and out of your pocket. So there ends up being a risk that people don't use them and that their data ends up being even less protected on a more physically vulnerable device. Do you think the thing like pins or Android pattern lock provides sufficient substitutes in this context? This is definitely a problem. I'm not sure that pins and pattern locks are sufficient, but they're a compromise that at least provides some potential for better security. I think the auth authentication model for mobile phones is effectively moving to one where you try to secure the device itself and realize that people are simply going to store passwords in the individual apps so that they aren't constantly being challenged for credentials, which are, of course, hard to enter on small keyboards, um, which is, as you, as you said, it, it is inconvenient. Um, I know Android 4 uh, supports facial recognition for authentication to the device. Now, I haven't had any personal experience or chance to try this out, uh, but it seems like an interesting approach, uh, at least in some cases, provided it works as advertised, uh, and that's saying a lot. Uh, I expect we'll continue to see biometrics used more and more with mobile phones since hands-free operation is so important with that particular form factor. Uh, there are significant challenges, however, with this approach, um, so I don't expect a perfect solution here. Staying with mobile devices, what do you think of the moves that some service providers have taken towards leveraging the user's cell phone as part of the authentication process? For example, Google, Windows Live and Facebook have all done this to some extent. I think it's a very promising development. Uh, one of the problems with low user acceptance of security tokens in the past has been that it represents yet one more thing that the user has to carry around with them at all times. If a user had accounts at multiple banks, then this might have necessitated uh, their having to keep up with multiple security tokens in order to satisfy multi-factor authentication requirements. The alternative was to use a biometric uh, as a second factor, but this created the burden of acquiring and installing readers every place a user might want to log in. The advantage of a cell phone is that more and more it is the case that uh, most people have them and then tend to keep them 
nearby anyway. So using this as part of the authentication system doesn't really incur uh, some of those same burdens because they, it's already there. There are, of course, some downsides. Uh, SMS or text-based messaging systems um, can be spoofed, and, and sometimes SMS messaging is what's used as a means for that authentication. Uh, and many other alternatives require a special app to be installed on the phone. And since mobile device security is in its infancy, as I mentioned previously, a cell phone could have been compromised by other apps that that user has downloaded as well. Another issue with apps is that not all cell phones are smartphones, although more and more are these days. And, and those uh, that are still represent a wide range of operating platforms that an app developer would need to support. For instance, they'd have to deal with multiple levels of iOS, of Android, of Windows Mobile, and so on and so forth. This is why a colleague and I have been working uh, in the area of leveraging out-of-band messaging that goes directly to the carrier, uh, and that can uh, be supported by all phones, whether they be smartphones or not, without the use of special apps. For instance, <clears throat> what you would do is, uh, uh, on your cell phone, uh, enter uh, some sequence like star and then my bank or whatever the name of the organization is, followed by a one-time password that you've been presented on the bank's website, followed by a pound sign, and then hit the send key uh, when, when you're prompted to do that for the authentication. And then that sends an out-of-bound message that is not as easily spoofed. Um, and then the advantage here being that if you lose your phone, you're probably going to recognize it much more quickly than you might if you lost a security token, and you'll report the loss because the phones have become such uh, an indispensable part of our daily lives that we realize when they're gone uh, more quickly. So my colleague and I have submitted some patents in this area uh, and, um, and also added some additional protections for various man-in-the-middle and phishing attack scenarios that we think will improve uh, security further still. You mentioned about other approaches, meaning that you end up with multiple security tokens. So what's your view about what many banks are now doing in terms of providing dedicated access devices and tokens to their users? It can be good, but it also end up being too much of a good thing if every organization insists on having their users leverage their unique device. Um, this is also the, there's also the cost of deploying, maintaining, and replacing devices and tokens, which is not trivial, um, as these devices do get lost and broken and so forth. And depending on the type of token chosen, uh, may also require effort to acquire the, the, co the tokens and cost there uh, to install in some cases. Uh, and maintain readers uh, in various places that may be vulnerable to physical attacks. In other words, biometrics are not just a matter of measuring the physical characteristics correctly, but also ensuring that the biometric reader is not vulnerable to attack and hasn't been tampered with. My concern is also around the extent to which this approach is scalable. For example, what if all your service providers decided to do it? I think it could end up being quite inconvenient if you needed to have lots of different tokens, and so people are likely to leave them at home, which takes away part of the flexibility of having online access in the first place. Okay, moving back to the more general level, to what extent do you think that users understand and value their online identity? My feeling is that in some cases it isn't really appreciated very much, and to some extent it's almost regarded as throwaway because of the ease of which new accounts can be set up. I'm sure there are millions of accounts out there actually lying dormant because people have forgotten that they have them or have forgotten their access details. I think the general population is just now beginning to comprehend what it means to have an identity stolen or used fraudulently. Uh, many assume that the organization who issued their identity is responsible for any damage or loss that may occur, and this may or may not be the case. Others delude themselves by saying, well, why would anyone want to steal my identity? I'm not rich or important or famous or what have you. Uh, but they're missing the point. Uh, still, I think the move is in the right direction as people are becoming more and more aware of the risks and consequences. But we've got a lot of work to do. I think elements of that attitude are still reflected in other aspects of security as well, such as the need to protect systems from online attack. Okay, so moving on, you mentioned biometrics earlier. So what are your views about these approaches? In concept, at least, I've always been quite a fan, as they can offer the potential for a stronger level of protection in a manner that's more convenient for the user. However, I don't think the reality necessarily fulfills this promise. I love the concept of biometrics. Uh, I may forget my password or misplace my security token, but I've never forgotten to bring my thumb with me. 
So that's an advantage. Uh, in theory, a good biometric uniquely identifies one and only one individual. In reality, this may not be the case. As with biometrics, we have to convert from the analog world we live in, with all its varying shades of gray, to a rock-solid certain digital approximation that a computer can process. In that translation, errors are inevitable, and this is why we have to build in acceptable levels of false accepts and false rejections. In other words, to the system, there are times when you might not be you because our tolerance for error is too low. Uh, in other cases, I might be you because the system is configured to accept too much variance. One good thing about passwords is that with them, uh, there's a miss is as good as a mile. You either get it right or you don't. The password systems don't say, well, you know, you, you got seven out of eight characters. That's close enough. Come on in. Uh, with biometrics, we must always deal with the level of uncertainty with that gray area. Added to that, uh, the risk is uh, the, of additional cost of deployment of the readers, which if they're not properly secured, as I mentioned, could be tampered with uh, and uh, used to steal biometric information from unsuspecting users. Uh, biometric technology continues to improve, but it isn't perfect. So I see it as a tool in the toolbox that we can use in appropriate situations but it's definitely not a panacea. So finally then, where do you feel things are heading in the next five years? Do you see passwords and pins being replaced anytime soon? I think passwords and pins will be with us for quite some time. Uh, the reason is that they are easily distributed, they don't require special hardware, and their management can be automated to keep costs low if uh, organizations are smart uh, enough to do that. It will simply be too tempting for many service providers, especially for low security applications, to not use knowledge-based authentication like passwords. I expect that biometric technology will continue to improve with greater accuracy and lower cost, but some of the fundamental issues will remain. Uh, also with biometrics, we will need to do a better job of user education so that people understand that they really don't represent the great privacy threat that many of them may envision. After all, anyone who wants to capture your fingerprints or face print or voice print can do that today without a great deal of effort. Watch any of the uh, TV crime shows and see how latent fingerprints are lifted off of all the objects you touch, as one example. I also expect that uh, mobile phones will be used to a much greater extent as authentication devices, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, as their de development deployment continues to grow, more and more people will have them. They'll become more and more indispensable. In short, though, I think we'll always face issues in trying to know if you are really you at the other end of a wire. Our techniques will get better, and so will the attack scenarios, so I expect the arms race to continue. Yes, I think we need be in no doubt about that last bit. Okay, we're coming to the end of our slot now, so Jeff, thank you very much again for sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate your giving me the opportunity to talk with you about this subject that is so near and dear to my heart, uh, proving that people are who they claim to be is a very old problem. As a society, in fact, we've developed all sorts of mechanisms to try to cope in the physical world, and each one offers us some benefits, but they can still be compromised. The problem only gets harder when we move it to cyberspace, where many of the observable, observable characteristics that we've come to rely on, such as a person's appearance, their mannerisms, their tone of voice, etc., cetera, um, those things uh, that helped us determine authenticity are in some cases no longer available to us or only available in limited ways on the internet for instance. Uh, it's a challenge that won't ever be solved completely I think but as attackers get more creative so must we in terms of devising more effective means of knowing if you are really you, uh, if you are who you claim to be. Uh, if you enjoy working on hard problems this is a good one uh, I think that will keep your mind occupied which is why, in fact, I enjoy working on it so much, I suppose. So thanks again for the opportunity.